People, of course, call the Gospel books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, they call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because we don't know who wrote these books, and there's no point calling them Sam, Fred, Jerry, and, he and Harry. I mean, they're, they're written by people we don't know who they were written by. Hello, Bezel Triple Three. That was Professor Bart Ehrman, evangelical scholar turned atheistic skeptic, talking about the Gospels in a debate with Professor Mike Lycona entitled, Can Historians Prove That Jesus Rose from the Dead? Now, this is a very interesting debate that you can find on YouTube. And I want you to notice how many who agree with Bart Ehrman's position take time to comment and say how Bart simply creamed Mike Lycona in this debate. That they care so much for someone to try to disprove Christianity is proof of the zealousness and fervency of their anti-God beliefs. But that's perhaps for another video. What I want to do is examine a few things that Bart stated in this debate that don't directly relate to the question, can historians prove the resurrection? I actually happen to agree with Bart here. The resurrection of Jesus cannot be scientifically proven from the historical evidence we have available. However, I do think that it can be shown forensically beyond any reasonable doubt that the tomb in which the crucified body of Jesus was placed on Friday was empty on Sunday. But why it was empty is a question that science cannot answer. But I'm convinced that God indeed did raise Jesus from the dead and that it, it is the best explanation of why the tomb was empty. So let's first hear from Bart as he talks about the value of the four gospels as primary historical sources about Jesus. The gospels are our sources for knowing about the resurrection of Jesus. Are they the kind of sources that historians would want when trying to establish what probably happened in the past? I think the answer to that question is no. Now, Bart is correct when he says that the Gospels are the best sources when trying to find out about the sayings and doings of Jesus of Nazareth. But his contention is that they're not good sources because they were written decades after the events and that the apostles who spoke Aramaic could not have written the Gospels, which were written in Greek. Okay, to their date, let's compare the writings of the Gospels with those of Euripides, for instance. Euripides wrote around 450 BC. The earliest copy in existence today dates around 1100 AD. That's quite a gap. The number of copies today in existence is nine. Now, that's not bad, but take the Gospel of Mark, for instance. Mark was written around 65 AD, and the earliest complete copy we have dates around 300 AD. That gap is minuscule compared to Euripides. The number of copies in existence? Well, it's more than nine. It's like in the thousands, and the other Gospels fare just as good or better. But if Mark, who was not an apostle, wrote his gospel some 30 years after the events, then how do we know that Mark got the stories right? Well, Mark was a close associate of the apostle Peter as evidenced by the writings of the bishop Papias, who wrote in the late first century. He said this in his writings, uh, in, in something called the Interpretation of the Oracles of the Lord. He wrote that Mark became Peter's interpreter and wrote accurately all that he remembered, not indeed in order, of the things said and done by the Lord. And the apostle Peter himself wrote this in his second letter. He said, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, I'm assuming that includes Mark. So we can see that Mark's gospel is based on eyewitness testimony. It also has the ring of a reliable historical account. It is a simple accounting of the, of the events. It doesn't try to cover the failures of the disciples or the apparent failure of his crucified master. The accuracy of place names and knowledge of Jewish customs, as well as geography, all point to Mark as a reliable account. The same can be said for both Matthew and Luke, as they most probably got a lot of the information they record from Mark's account. None of the authors were eyewitnesses. Paul himself indicates that he was not an eyewitness, and none of the gospel writers was an eyewitness. People, of course, call the gospel books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
Well, they call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because we don't know who wrote these books, and there's no point calling them Sam, Fred, Jerry, and, ha and Harry. I mean, they're, they're written by people we don't know who they were written by. No, now that's not correct. Now, for sure, Mark and Luke were not eyewitnesses, but just as we saw that Mark was a close associate of the Apostle Peter, who was an eyewitness, well, in the case of Luke, he tells us himself in the first paragraph of his gospel that he had composed an orderly account from those who were from the beginning eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Now, what's fascinating here is that Luke was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul as evidenced by the we language in Luke's writing of Acts. Now, get this. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, we read that after three years, he says, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, now that's Peter, and remained with him 15 days. And that's in chapter 1, verse 18. Here we have the Apostle Paul around 35 AD spending time with the Apostle Peter. And as one writer said, we can presume they did not spend all that time talking about the weather but rather were discussing the details of the life of Jesus from one who was a first-hand observer. Luke, in turn, got this same information from Paul. Now, as for Matthew and John, the early church fathers attributed authorship to both of them. An early 2nd uh, century guy named Papias wrote of Matthew as being the author of a gospel, and later that century, Irenaeus quoted Polycarp regarding John's authorship of the last gospel. You see, it's the church that recognized them as authoritative and having apostolic authority very early on. Where did these authors get their stories from? Well, if they were not disciples of Jesus, they must have heard the stories from somebody. Who heard the stories from somebody, who heard the stories from somebody, who heard them from somebody. Stories about Jesus, including his resurrection, had been in circulation year after year after year from the time that his disciples knew that he got killed and believed he got raised from the dead. They told stories to convert people. They improved the story sometimes. They changed the story sometimes. The stories got modified in the process of transmission over the course of decades before anybody wrote the stories down. Now Bart here is leaving no room for the strong possibility that the things that Jesus said, his stories, or later sermons, were put down in some kind of writing that predated the Gospels themselves. That is a possibility. He also ignores the importance of memorization in first century Judaism ensuring the reliable oral transmission of such important information. Our friend Bart, like many other skeptics, makes the same mistake by comparing ancient oral transmission to today's child game of telephone. But, but they're worlds apart. Keep in mind that Jesus used things such as parables, metaphors, and riddles that helped his disciples and his larger audience to remember the things he taught. Simply read Mark's account of Jesus' death and then read John's account of Jesus' death and make a list of everything that happens in both and compare your lists. You will find that there are stunning differences. In fact, there are discrepancies. You know what's funny? If the Gospels were the same in every detail, then skeptics would be immediately accusing the Gospel writers of collusion. This is not the problem that Bart makes it out to be. Each gospel writer provides their own set of details of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some agree with one another and some don't. You would expect that of different people relating an eyewitness account of a particular event. Every one of the alleged contradictions within the details given actually fall right into place with a little bit of patience and some closer examination. Take, for instance, the day in which Jesus was crucified. Was it Thursday or Friday? Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say Friday, but John seems to indicate Thursday. John writes, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. Now that sounds like Thursday. However, Friday was the traditional day of preparation for the weekly Sabbath. Well, one thing is evident. All four Gospels agree that Jesus was crucified died and was buried, and three days later, that same Jesus was seen alive by various people. The Gospel of John is the only Gospel that explicitly identifies Jesus as God, and the only Gospel in which Jesus himself calls himself God. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke do not have Jesus call himself God. If our earliest Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, thought Jesus was God and thought that he called himself God, wouldn't that be a rather remarkable thing to leave out of a Gospel? They just forgot to report that part? Okay. First of all, Jesus nowhere in the Gospels ever says, I am God, not even in John. However, John, being the last gospel to be written, and written by someone who was intimately close to the Savior, and has had a longer time to digest the deeper meanings of the sayings and events of Jesus, does provide much more theological precision and depth than do the other gospel writers. Only in John do we find statements like, The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Or, Before Abraham was, I am. Or, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But, how about this one in John 10, 36, where we read, Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into this world, You are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Well, now go to the first verse in Mark, and what do we find there? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Or how about in Mark chapter 2, where we find this, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes who were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. For who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, there are pointers of the divinity of Jesus all over Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And here's another example. In the Old Testament, we find the prophets using the phrase, Thus saith the Lord. It occurs 414 times. But Jesus never says it once. Instead, we find Jesus actually speaking as God himself. Here's the example I want to give. Matthew 5.27. Jesus says, You heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. Now, as you may know, this is the seventh commandment. But then, does Jesus say, Thus saith the Lord? No. He says, But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, there are many other examples of this. So much for Bart's claim that the Gospel of John is the only Gospel to identify Jesus as God. Now, this is how Bart ends his debate with Michael Lycona. Theologians can talk about the resurrection of Jesus and emphasize that it's the most important aspect of the Christian religion. But when they emphasize that Jesus was raised from the dead, they're making a theological judgment about something that God did. They are not making a historical judgment that can be verified by historians. If historians could verify it, university professors who teach history would all believe it. They don't believe it. They're historians, and they know that you cannot establish miracle on the basis of historical evidence. Thank you very much. Now, as I said at the beginning, I agree with Bart that the resurrection of Jesus cannot be scientifically proven from the historical evidence we have available. But from what we do have, not only from the Gospels, but from the earlier writings of the Apostle Paul, who wrote, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the Twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of who are still alive, though some have died. Paul's point here is more than just a few people saw Jesus alive after his death. Now, I believe it can be proven that beyond reasonable doubt, the tomb of Jesus, the tomb he was placed in on Friday, was empty on Sunday. Now, I admit a bodily resurrection does require a miracle, and that's a showstopper for a lot of people. Okay, perhaps the body of Jesus was thrown in a common grave and eaten by dogs. Perhaps he really didn't die, but was revived in the cool of the tomb after repeated beatings and extended physical exhaustion. However, to try to reconcile these explanations for the empty tomb as the reason for this tiny, cowardly band of Jewish, staunchly monotheistic followers of Jesus to be transformed into ultra-passionate proclaimers of Jesus as the resurrected Jewish Messiah and the very God of Abraham in human flesh is also quite a large stretch. Think about it.